Hello everybody and good morning from Wyoming. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning here. So uh, I appreciate uh, Bob for the invitation and all of you for uh, your interest. Can you see my screen, Bob? Yeah, uh, no. I can see you. All right, let me go to Skype. This should make it better. Perfect. Gray beard. How's that? Perfect. Okay. And there's some water here for you if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so the subject that I want to address today is the question which I think is at the heart of the conference that you guys are attending, which is how much do deep neural networks understand the images that they recognize? Um, we all know that deep neural networks can do amazing things nowadays, and the question is, you know, do they really understand what they're doing, or as the subject of the conference suggests, are they a clever Hans that is doing it through some quick, simple hack that um, belies uh, real understanding? So uh, I'm, I'm from the Evolving Artificial Intelligence Lab at the University of Wyoming. Before I start on the subject of today, I want to quickly tell you a little bit about the other things that I'm not going to have time to tell you about. In case you're interested in any of these subjects, you can check out our papers or email me. Um, or come visit Wyoming. So uh, we do a lot of work on robots, such as robots that can recover from damage, as in the case of this uh, article here that was on the cover of Nature. We do a lot of deep learning work. You're going to hear about some of that today. We also do a lot of neuroevolution, where we use evolution to evolve neural network controllers, such as for reinforcement tasks like robotics. Uh, we try to produce creative ro robots, and we also do a lot of computational biology, which is to try to ask and answer open questions in evolutionary biology. But we're here to talk about deep learning. I'm sure that most of you are familiar that deep learning uh, can do many things, but one of the things that it's most famous for is kind of some sort of simple input-output mapping. Uh, simple in terms of the, the input and output uh, that we give it, um, but the task itself is quite hard. So we might give it a picture of a lion, and then its job is to say lion, or we might ask it to translate, such as you know, give it some Latin, and it spits out the equivalent in English. Um, and the most famous result coming out of deep learning is that it has become very, very good at image recognition. Uh, so this is the famous AlexNet from 2012. I give it these pictures, and then it suggests underneath uh, what it thinks those pictures are. And in most cases, it's correct, like the giant panda here. And you can see its confidence. But in the pumpkin case, it actually gets that wrong. It calls it a sunflower. <clears throat> but you can kind of see why, <coughs> why, it, <coughs> sorry, why it thinks it's a field of sunflowers. I also want to point out how large these, image, these uh, neural networks are. We'll get back to that in a second. But these are you know, something similar to a, uh, a computational model of a brain. It's huge, and it's performing now roughly at the uh, performance of humans. So it's, we, some people would even say that deep neural, now, neural networks are now better than humans at classifying images, at least in some limited domains. So. Uh, here we go looking at one of these deep neural networks. This is a model of AlexNet or a drawing of AlexNet. And I just wanted to give you a sense of the scale. We're talking about uh, over a million neurons and a hundred million weights. So the learning algorithm, deep learning, is actually learning to the, exact, the exact weights for a hundred million different connections, which is just a very, very, very large number. And that makes it very difficult to understand exactly how these networks work. And that kind of raises the question that is the theme of this workshop. Are they really intelligent, or is there some sort of simple hack buried deep in this network that we just don't understand? And we're going to talk about that today. So in case you're not familiar with neural networks, these drawings may be a little abstract. This is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of neurons in one layer connected to a whole bunch of neurons in another layer, all the way down to a final output layer that might say, oh, that's a lion. Uh, and, you know, but remember, this drawing here, I think, has like maybe a thousand or a couple hundred weights in it. But the real drawing has a hundred million weights, so I can't draw that on one screen. So it's just a very, very complicated artifact. Now, one of the hopes since the dawn of deep learning is that something like this would happen. We put in a picture, such as my friend Joel here, at the bottom, a whole bunch of pixels. And those goes into this input layer. And then what happens is in the lower level layers, you get things like edge detectors, which we also see in, the, uh, in animal brains. And then those edges get combined at a mid-level mid into uh, parts, such as a mouth or an eye. And then mouths and eyes get combined into different face detectors. Uh, at the top. 
And that should happen for any type of data. Here I'm just doing it for a face recognition net. So the, you know, this is what we hope will happen, and there's been a fair amount of evidence that this is happening, but that's kind of an open question is, does, the, does deep learning work the way we think it does? But the largest thing that I want to uh, have the intro that this talk be about is just this idea that deep neural networks are currently entirely a black box. We uh, don't really know what's happening inside them. This is kind of one of the drawbacks to them, and it's one of the, the most notorious things about deep neural networks, is when they work, we don't know how they work. And now that they're working tremendously well, that becomes a fascinating question, which is how do they do this uh, amazing feat? So uh, I call this the beginning of AI neuroscience. And I guess I shouldn't call it the beginning. It's been going on for a long time. But now that the networks are truly huge, and now that they're doing truly amazing feats at even superhuman levels, it really kind of uh, motivates, I think, a huge chunk of researchers to try to do what neuroscientists do, which is you're given this fantastically complicated artifact uh, and go try to figure out how it works and use whatever tools you can to shine some light into this black box and see how it does what it does. So there are many, many ways that neuroscientists try to understand the human and animal and other animal brains. Uh, I'm going to show you one or talk about one because we're going to basically use the same technique. And it uh, comes, the most famous version of this comes from this paper from uh, Kiroga in Nature in 2005. And the general idea is that I'm going to go in and I'm going to stick an electrode in some poor subject's brain. In this case, it was people that were having surgery for other reasons. Uh, and they literally put a wire into the brain somewhere randomly, and that wire happens to be close to a neuron, and then they're just going to start showing it pictures, one after the other, as many as the subject can tolerate, and they're going to record the output of that neuron and see when does that neuron fire. And you can imagine that in this case we have a neuron that does not fire from a picture of a motorcycle or a waterfall, but it does fire for a picture of Halle Berry, who is pictured here. <clears throat> And uh, now that we have this response, if fire is in response to Holly Berry, you know, I would pose the question to you in the room, what does this neuron for? And you could imagine that it might be you know, a Holly Berry neuron, or it might, might be an actress neuron, or it might be a, a human woman neuron, and we don't really know. So the next thing you would do is you would go through and you would try to show it maybe other pictures of Holly Berry. And that's what they did in this paper. And they found what I consider to be just a jaw-dropping result. And that is that this neuron will respond to very di different pictures of how they vary. Uh, whether or not she's in a, a, you know, an evening gown or a close-up of her face with sunglasses. It also even responded to a picture of her wearing a Catwoman suit. Uh, so very different visual stimuli. Incredibly, it responded to a line drawing, like an artist rendering of how they <coughs> And perhaps the most incredible, it responds to the word Holly Berry printed out in text. So that's the one that really kind of puts it over the top for me. This is really an, the abstract platonic concept of Holly Berry in one neuron in somebody's brain. Now, I, uh, I and the authors don't think it's one neuron. It's probably a network of neurons that we tap into. Be tapped into. But it certainly seems very, very strange. It does not respond to, say, pictures of Kobe Bryant or Jenny An Jennifer Aniston or Bill Clinton, etc. So we're starting to try to get a sense that this neuron is very specific to the concept, at least, of Halle Berry, given what we've tested. They also went through and found um, different neurons for Jennifer Aniston, Bill Clinton, etc. Now, the question is, is it really a Halle Berry neuron? Or, as I mentioned earlier, is it an African-American actress neuron or something else? Uh, or in the sense of this, this conference, maybe it's some sort of clever hack that focuses on some feature unique to Halle Berry, like a prominent cheekbone that is not present in all of the other pictures that they showed. So how would you find this out? Well, you know, you could take this poor subject uh, and you could keep showing them an infinite number of pictures and try to uh, get to the bottom of this, but that's not going to scale because you can't, you know, show it, you can't think of all the things that it might be. Uh, and also, you might not have that much time with the subject. So think back to the tank example. Bob, have you guys already talked about the tank example today? No. No? no. Okay, so there's, there's this fantastically uh, interesting story in the early days of neural networks where these people went out and they wanted to have a neural network that would recognize tanks uh, hiding in the trees, etc. so the military could recognize when, it's, you know, when there's a tank uh, disguise. And so they went out and they took a whole bunch of pictures of, of tanks and then they went out another, and they took a whole bunch of pictures of you know, the same kind of scenes without tanks. And they took half of, the ta of that, that data set and they trained the neural network. And the neural network became perfect. It was always able to recognize the tanks 
whether or not there was a tank in the image, which you know was unheard of accuracy back in the day. And then they said, okay, well, maybe it's just memorizing the, the test set that result seems too good. So let's show it some images it's never seen from the same distribution of images, and uh, we'll see if it can recognize tanks. And sure enough, it's perfect, I think, 100%. It's always able to tell if there's a tank, and it's never, you know, call, saying that there's a tank there when there's not. And they were like, this is too good to be true. So they went and they tested it on a new set of images and found it was terrible. It was basically random. It was no better than chance. So they thought they had this tank detector. Turns out they had garbage. But they still didn't know what it was doing on that initial set of images to perform so well. And then somebody noticed that they had taken all of the pictures of the tanks on a gray, cloudy day. And they had taken up all of the pictures of the of fields without tank on a blue sky day. So basically, the neural network was just a color of the, the sky detector, not a tank detector. So it looked like it was doing this very clever thing, and then it turned out to be doing something quite simple that was not what we thought it was doing. In, the sen in that sense, it's a, a true clever Hans. Uh, I, assume, I assume you explain what clever Hans is. Yes. Yes, good. So my question is, what would be the ideal test of whether or not this neuron is a Holly Berry neuron? And I would, I would say that the ideal thing would not be show it a bunch of pictures and see what it responds to, because you might have to show it an infinite number of pictures to understand what it's truly uh, interested in seeing. Instead, what you could do is you could synthesize or try to automatically draw an image that maximally lights up this neuron. And if you did that repeatedly and you got all of these images, then you would say, oh, this isn't a Holly Berry neuron. This is an African-American actress neuron. Uh, but if you synthesize a whole bunch of images, and every single image was actually a picture of Holly Berry, here I've grabbed them from Google Images, then you could pretty well conclude this is a Holly Berry neuron. So if you go back to the tank example, if you synthesize images that maximally light up this neural network, and you get these pictures, and none of them have tanks in them, but they all have gray skies, you might quickly understand, oh, this was a gray sky detector, not a tank detector. But if all of the images had tanks, then you would know you might have the real thing. So we want to basically do that. That's going to be our uh, experimental protocol. So that is very difficult to do with a human brain or an animal brain. We'll return to that later. But with deep neural networks, it is possible to synthetically generate images that light up particular neurons. And that allows us to ask and try to shed some light on some very interesting questions about deep neural networks, such as how much do they understand about the objects they recognize, do they have these increasingly abstract feature detectors in the hierarchical sense that we want them to? Are they multifaceted in the sense that they can respond to all of the many different kind of images or inputs that might light up a certain platonic concept? For example, would they respond to Halle Berry in a cat suit and the word Halle Berry and a picture of her at the Academy Awards? Are neural networks uh, representations local or distributed? What sorts of errors do they make, etc.? So how might we do that? Well, let's take a pre-trained network. Let's assume that you are Google and you've trained a network and you want to know how it works or you want to deploy it on a driverless car and you want to make sure it's not going to mess up. So in the left, I'm giving you, this is kind of like you in industry or in medicine or whatever, you have a network and you want me uh, to try to help you understand it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take that network and then I'm going to start this process with an artist. But the artist is going to generate a picture. It might at the beginning be a very random looking picture. And then I show it to the network. And let's assume that I'm trying to find out what this neuron here, this lion uh, neuron, can do. Uh, or what does it want to see? Is it really a lion neuron? Well, I, I pay the picture. It might light up the lion neuron a very little bit, like 1%. And then I, sh I say to the artist, okay, that lit up the, this neuron like at a level of 1%. The artist will then change the drawing or the picture a little bit and then see if this neuron's activation went up or down. And then if it went up, keep the image. If it went down, throw it out, go back. And then just keep iterating this process where you make small changes to the image to increasingly light up this neuron. And eventually, if you get a drawing that really, really activates this neuron, maybe it would look like this, like a lion, and it would tell you what this neuron wants to see. And then I could repeat that process over and over again. Bob, you can see my mouse, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, I also want to point out that in this case, 
I know that this is a lion neuron because it's my output neuron and I've trained a network to study lion when it sees a lion. But I don't know how the internals of this network work and that maybe is the, the most interesting thing. So I can also clamp a neuron in the middle of this network and then do the same process with the same artist and maybe I would get an, a lion eye detector or a lion mouth detector or a lion tail detector and I could start to figure out what, is the, how is, like, what are the features that this network is keying on to identify lions. So we call this deep visualization, and I want to show you take one of this, which is uh, the most, you know, maybe the most naive and easy way to go about this process. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take this pre-trained network, and remember this network is trained. It's really, really good at what it does. So if I give it a guitar and I put it in, out will come uh, this answer. If that's a guitar with 98% confidence. Or if I put in a penguin. It will say, oh, that's a penguin with 99.99% confidence. And these are actual numbers in response to these pictures out of AlexNet. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that network, I'm going to freeze it. I'm not going to train it or change any of its weights. I'm going to basically just uh, analyze it. And I'm going to start with a random picture, put it in, and it might say, oh, that's a guitar with 1.3 confidence, and I think that's a penguin with 0.7 confidence. And then what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to have this evolutionary algorithm. You don't really have to know what that is, but this is our artist. It's going to take these pictures, it's going to change them a little bit, it's going to send them into the network, and if the score goes up, it's going to keep it. If not, it's going to revert, and it's going to keep doing that and make little changes until these, now, whatever images I'm giving it that this algorithm has produced is now producing, for Penguin, 99%, and for Guitar, a different picture will produce 99.9%. .9%. And I would ask you, the audience, to guess, what will these images look like? And you would probably guess, oh, they're going to look like guitars and penguins. Unless you've already heard of this paper before. The answer is, shockingly, that the images look like total garbage. They don't look anything like armadillos or jackfruits or peacocks. But yet, all of these images, the deep neural network, in this case AlexNet, is 99.6 or greater percent sure that this image belongs to this label and this image is a jackfruit, etc. So when we first saw these images, we were really blown away. And we said, OK, well, maybe the problem is that we're doing mutations pixel by pixel. Maybe it's not even possible for this search algorithm to produce a realistic uh, image. So we decided to try a different kind of evolutionary algorithm that produces a different style of images. And here we go. We have uh, the network is absolutely convinced that this is a starfish and this is a baseball, et cetera. It's perfectly convinced. And so um, there's one more technique that we can use, which is not an evolutionary algorithm, but it's, which is actually to use backpropagation. But instead of changing the weights via backpropagation, we're going to change each pixel to light up this neuron. And we can use some clever math and calculus to figure out how to do that. And here are the images we get. So this apparently is a bikini, and this is an arctic fox, and this is a cliff dwelling, etc. So obviously these things don't look anything like the images that they're supposed to. So we publish this in a paper called Deep Neural Networks Are Easily Fooled, High Confidence Predictions for Unrecognizable Images. And uh, you know the main point of the paper was that AI is seeing the world differently. Maybe it's a clever Hans. We didn't use that term because Bob hadn't pointed out to me how appropriate the analogy is yet. Um, and we also pointed out this is a huge security concern because you can obviously produce these kind of images on a t-shirt or on a billboard and cause a, like a deep neural network on a driverless car to think that it's seeing a school bus when it's really seeing somebody's rugby shirt or a child's sticker or something. So this is potentially a problem. We also tried it on MNIST. So these are all, it's, the network is absolutely convinced that that's, those are fours and these are sevens and that these are fours. So it's just wild. Uh, you might say, okay, well, just train it on these examples. Put these in as negative examples to the network and retrain it. And the answer is it doesn't really work. Uh, the network consistently can be fooled, even if you give it access to the previous fooling examples. So a couple other interesting side effects. One is that you can, if this is one train network and I create a, a fooling image that produces a real image that says lion, I can go to another neural network and show it the same image and it will say lion, as you would expect. But if I give it this starfish image, which it thinks is a starfish but clearly isn't, I can go to a different neural network and show it the same image and it will also say starfish. So it's almost like all the neural networks out there agree that this is obviously a starfish and just think that us silly humans don't realize that that's truly a starfish. It's quite remarkable. 
Uh, you can do this in many different ways, and I'll just skip over some of the results. So, um, this paper created a, a huge splash. It was actually the 63rd most talked about scientific paper in the world last year. Uh, and with lots of media attention, it also got a lot of, oh, here's Google's uh, co-founder with uh, my friend Gary Marcus, who printed up a t-shirt that says, don't worry, killer robot, I'm really a starfish. <laughs> you could hide from these things by put wearing this silly t-shirt, etc. Uh, it also was very well received academically, uh, including at this conference. So I, do, why do I put all that, um, the kind of reaction, and I'll tell you about the reaction. The reason is because I just think that this struck a very deep core, not only, or core, sorry, not only with uh, AI researchers, but also just with humanity. And I think it's because there's a lot of interest in this question of whether or not deep learning is, had, you know, is exhibiting real intelligence, or if it's just a clever Hans. So I kind of want to just say that I think that the subject of this conference is well motivated because people really care about uh, what's going on in, within the, with the intelligence in these networks. So um, this system can also produce art. So these images, to me, when I just saw them, like this is like a really kind of artistic representation of a prison or a fire, et cetera. And so we actually took some of the images produced by this network and we submitted them to uh, an art competition uh, here at the university, where students tend to submit their work and only 35% tend to get accepted. And not only did our submission get accepted, but it was also given an award. And the judges did not know that it was AI generated. So that's a little bit of a tangent from the main topic, but I just think it's kind of another example of this uh, clever Hans or, uh, um, you know, uh, is it re these, the, the judges thought that this was you know, produced by a human artist and the Deep Neural Network did it and is it really an artist or is it just it's kind of faking? Those are interesting questions. So I want to get back to the question which is why are these networks easily fooled? And uh, there's two different hypotheses. Uh, one of them is that you know, if I, the deep neural networks are trained in a supervised way. So they're putting down this decision boundary between say orange and blue dots. And, uh, you know, so maybe these are starfish here. But then I ask it in an optimization sense, I say, show me the image that is absolutely maximally starfish and nothing else. Well, maybe that causes optimization to produce an image really far away from the, the true data. Duck. And therefore, it does know what a starfish is. But if you run really far away from it, they can produce something that doesn't look to us like a starfish, but is hacking a network. Uh, in the sense that maybe it actually does kind of know what this blue area is, or we're just asking it to run away. Um, so the prediction is that if we actually constrain optimization to stay near these points, don't just go as far away from possible, maybe we will start to see starfishes, uh, and that the test is bad by, by asking it to, with an unconstrained way, just run away from the decision boundary. Another hypothesis is is that these networks actually know what a, heart, a starfish is. So instead of modeling that a starfish has five legs and you know, is a continuous object, it's just hacking on uh, and keying on these like, unique features. Like it has some sort of textured blue and some sort of textured orange. And that's it. If it sees that, it calls it a starfish, which means it's learned to hack to classify starfish without really understanding what a starfish is. Same with the school bus. So th these hypotheses make different predictions. One is that if we constrain start optimization to be near natural images, we'll get starfish. This hypothesis, though, says even if we constrain uh, the search to be near the, the, what it thinks are starfishes, we'll still get um, kind of hacks because it's not truly understood what a starfish is. So we're going to test that hypothesis. So far, the, it looks like the clever Hans hypothesis is winning. But the, the, that was take one, which we did. I'm going to just. We're going to use this style of images, which are the ones produced with backpropagation in the pixel space. And we're going to do this again, but this time in take two, we're going to start to say you have to stay near the natural images, what we call natural image priors. So you have a prior bias to trying to be near natural images. You can't produce these crazy pixelated images. Now, how do we get these natural image priors? We just manually engineered them. So we said, oh, nearby pixels should have to be similar in color, and <clears throat> you can't have extreme pixel values. We just hand programmed in a few biases, and we produced a new set of images. And these are in this deep visualization toolbox paper. And already, you can start to see now, when I have the AI artist in the optimization, produce images that light up the pool table or flamingo class, I start to get things that look like flamingos and pool tables and black swans and school buses. 
So this starts to say to me, maybe they do understand. It tips the scales towards the understanding hypothesis, that they really do know what a school bus is, and it's just that the test isn't very good. So we'll do another version of the test with different manually engineered uh, uh, in, uh, natural image priors. And um, I'll return to this paper. But basically, we're going to redo this process with different hand engineered, hopefully better priors. And this is what we get. And when I saw these images for the first time, I really started to conclude, oh, these networks do understand these concepts. This network, when you light up the jack-o'-lantern neuron, you get a jack-o'-lantern. Same thing with candle up on hourglass. Now, these images aren't perfect, but maybe it's just because we don't have very, very good priors. So our take four, and again, this tips the scale towards the fact that they understand. Our take four uh, approach is our most recent approach, and this will should be uh, presented at the NIPS conference this uh, December. And here, we're going to do better than trying to sit down and hand engineer priors that um, bias images towards natural images, we're actually going to use AI. So we're going to train a deep neural network. In an, uh, and it, this uses um, generative adversarial networks, which Ian Goodfellow is going to talk about in about an hour, uh, and some other techniques like DeepSim and Upcom. You might not know what those are. The general idea is we're actually going to use AI as the artist. We're, say, we're going to tell AI, we're going to train it to be an artist that can make pictures where the pictures themselves look really, really natural. And once we train that artist, then we're going to ask that artist to be part of our optimization process, where I specifically try to produce pictures that light up this neuron, or this neuron, or this neuron. And what we do that, so now the natural images are learned, not hand-coded. And when we do that, this is the result. And when my graduate student, Ang and Yuen, who is the lead author on this work, sent me these images, I really stood up and did a little dance, because I was so blown away and excited about to see that this is what the neuron thinks is a lawnmower and an entertainment center and a beetle and a, you know, a mosque, etc. a cheeseburger. That almost looks like a cheeseburger I, I could pick up and eat, except I'm a vegetarian, so I wouldn't do that. Uh, in any case, the network really seems to understand what these uh, concepts are. And so here are some more examples, uh, which I just think are amazing. I mean, this cowboy bit, I, as somebody who's in Wyoming, that is what it looks, people look like when they uh, walk around with cowboy boots. Uh, and beer, you know, et cetera. So um, we now, I really think that this kind of kind of blows away the hypothesis that these networks are clever Hanses. Uh, it really suggests that they do deeply understand each of these concepts because inside the network is this representation of a beer. That's what it wants to see once you constrain the search. So I told you uh, that you can go into the middle of the network and look at every single neuron along the way. And so here we can go and do that. Look, the, the lower level of things are edge detectors like we thought. Then we start to get corners and edges. Then we start to get things that look like faces and dogs or something that recognizes water or a, like a mountain scene. Higher up in the network, you get an eye detector or a bucket detector. And then things got, start to get pretty weird when you go higher, even higher, like this one-eyed turtle. I don't know what that is. Uh, and then we get all the way up, of course, to the class labels where it can recognize an ostrich or a restaurant, et cetera. Uh, so we do think that there's this hierarchical composition. Um, another thing that we wanted to ask is, are these things multifaceted? Can they get the text of Holly Berry and the line drawing and the cat suit? We don't have a Holly Berry class, but we do have a bell pepper class. And so these are images from the real training set that light up the bell pepper neuron from ImageNet in AlexNet. And you can see there's like a green pepper area, the red pepper area, et cetera. <clears throat> and so we challenge optimization not just to generate one image that lights up the green pepper, the bell pepper neuron, but the set of images that lights up the bell pepper image. And here's what we get. We can get an image that is uh, mostly like red peppers on a white background, red peppers on a red background, green peppers, multiple green peppers, a single red pepper, etc. So that means that this bell pepper neuron, when you synthesize the set of things that light it up, it has this multifaceted, multimodal understanding of all the different ways to be a bell pepper. Here is the, the movie theater class. So you have the inside of the theater, uh, the outside of the theater, at day, at night, etc. Again, for cars, yellow cars, red cars, cars looking at you where you see the headlights, cars looking away from you where you see, well, I don't get a license plate there, but etc. So you can go uh, interact with these networks. We produce this toolbox that's online. Uh, and this video on YouTube, I recommend it if you're interested in kind of probing. Uh, one final question, which is, are um, 
deep neural network representation is local or distributed? The answer is actually complicated, but the way that we tested this is we trained multiple different networks and we see do they tend to learn the same features? And the answer is that for the most active features, the most useful features, different brains will learn similar features. So these are two different networks that have learned all of these edge detectors and all of these grid detectors and face detectors, etc. But the rare features can be different. So you can think about that in the sense of an art artist being creative. We probably share the core, and we, uh, the tail is different in our brains in terms of how we see the world. So uh, the, to conclude, because I'm a little bit over time, so I'm rushing through this, our initial fooling work, which uh, you know, suggested that deep learning is a clever Hans, that it's not truly understanding what it means to be a starfish. It's just latching on to discriminative features that are unique in the starfish set of images that aren't present. But later, as we started to constrain search and not let it just go anywhere in the search space, but said you have to you know, be, produce images that are natural, now we see that it really does understand these concepts. So it knows that a lawnmower uh, you know, looks like this. It also knows the context. So it knows that a lawnmower should have la green grass around it, or a pool table should be inside and have lights over it. So um, there's actually a pretty deep understanding of what these concepts are. Uh, it also understands the multifaceted nature of the classes that it can recognize, such as all these different classes of bell pepper. On the way, in the intermediate layers, they do have this hierarchical composition of features, like this eye detector from a dog, or this bucket detector, etc. And so, um, there, oops, uh, there is, I kind of just want to say that, basically, why do these things tend to be fooled in the first place? Well, we think it's one because we were asking it to make the, the most uh, extreme starfish possible, and maybe that produced pathological results. But also because the space of possible images is infinitely vast, and we haven't asked for that it's a starfish and nothing else out of the entire space of images. We've only asked it to recognize starfish within the space of the types of images we've shown it, which are natural images. So once we constrain optimization to also be only within the space of natural images, then we do tend to get uh, things that look like lawnmowers and starfish and pool tables, etc. So um, I think that these things do kind of have a deep understanding. So what's some future possible work, especially for the people in, the, in your room? One is, um, and Bob's already been working on this, you know, he's, done, he's proven that you can fool these networks that do music classification, such as jazz and rock and roll. But my, my, now I want to challenge the second part, which is, okay, now that we can prove that you can fool them, can you learn the natural priors of music or audio or whatever it is that you want to do to actually start synthesizing realistic jazz and rock and roll? Because these systems can be generative. They can start producing new music that's very, very interesting and accurate, as opposed to fooling music, if you can learn these natural priors or hand code them. Uh, we obviously we want to check this all. Everything we've done is with supervised learning, but if you also you can check and see, do unsupervised learning networks also understand, even at a deeper sense, what it means to be a, a starfish or rock and roll? Same with reinforcement learning. And finally, could you do this for real brains? So Christoph Koch, who runs the, uh, the Allen Brain Institute and was a co-author on that Taroga paper with Holly Berry in Nature, they've contacted us and they're interested in trying this in real brains. And uh, we don't know if that's possible, but we want to try. Just imagine how cool it would be to put a probe into like a, a finch that can only recognize its mate's song versus everybody else and synthesize the song that it, you know, its platonic concept of a song. So with that, I want to say thanks to my, especially to the people who have taken the lead on a lot of these technical projects and have done a lot. I have a lot of other co-authors I'd like to thank, but the list would be too long. And also to the NSF for funding this work. Thank you.